embarrassing. I posted that video to Twitter this week, if you follow me on Twitter. And it, last time I checked, has over 1.5 million views, almost 50,000 likes. Uh, it was the first time I'd seen that video of them tearing down the U.S. flag on the Capitol building and hoisting a Trump flag in its place on January 6th. You know, January 6th matters. And so this episode is just me. You got stuck with me this week. We're going to talk about January 6th and, and why it matters and why we can't afford to memory hole it. And, and how much do we have to talk about this? Here is Donald Trump at the debate. He was asked if he has any regrets about January 6th. And this is Donald Trump's answer. Uh, Mr. President, on January 6th, you told your supporters to march to the Capitol. You said you would be right there with them. Uh, the country and the world saw what played out of the Capitol that day, the officers coming under attack. Aides in the West Wing say you watched it unfold on television off the Oval Office. Uh, you did send out tweets, but it was more than two hours before you sent out that video message uh, telling your supporters to go home. Is there anything you regret about what you did on that day? You just said a thing that isn't covered peacefully and patriotically, I said, during my speech, not later on. Peacefully and patriotically. And nobody on the other side was killed. Ashley Babbitt was shot by an out-of-control police officer that should have never, ever shot her. It's a disgrace. But we didn't do this group of people that have been treated so badly. I ask, what about all the people that are pouring into our country and killing people that she allowed to pour in? She was the border czar, remember that. She was the border czar. She doesn't want to be called the border czar because she's embarrassed by the border. In fact, she said at the beginning, well, I'm surprised you're not talking about the border yet. That's because she knows what a bad job they've done. So there's a lot in that clip. Let's start at the beginning. He's asked about Jeremy if he has regrets. He clearly has no regrets, none at all. And then there's the disturbing part in the middle where he says the only person that got killed was Ashley Babbitt. No one on the other side was killed. I want you to wrap your head around that. At the time of January 6th, he was the serving president of the United States of America. Capitol Police, Metro Police, serving members of Congress and their staff were the other side. He is claiming the people who attacked the Capitol were his side. Wrap your head around that, because that was two weeks ago, y'all, during the debate. He was served up the opportunity, and he simply accepts no responsibility for what many of us know is one of the most disgusting days in United States history. And not only that, he then goes on to say crazy shit, okay? <laughs> like this clip. This, this is him talking about January 6th, again, in a recent speech just last week. Never see the picture of the crowd, the biggest crowd I've ever spoken. I've spoken to the biggest crowds. Nobody's spoken to crowds bigger than me. If you look at Martin Luther King, when he uh, did his speech, his great speech, and you look at ours, same real estate, same everything, same number of people. If not, we had more. And they said he had a million people, but I had 25,000 people. But when you look at the exact same picture, and everything's the same because it was the fountains, the whole thing, all the way back to uh, from Lincoln to Washington. And you look at it, and you look at the picture of his crowd, my crowd. Uh, we actually had more people. They said I had 25,000, and he had a million people. And I'm OK with it because I liked Dr. Martin Luther King. Yeah. Yeah. His frustration with January 6th is he didn't get credit for the size of his crowd at the speech he gave on the ellipse. You know, that's after he earlier in that our first clip talked about how he said peacefully, he said peacefully, he said the word peacefully a single time. The rest of the time he talked about go fight. You're gonna lose your country if you don't fight like hell. Those are the words he used, fight like hell. And the crowd heard that. Well, we can't, you know, <laughs> you know, we can't forget it, right? And we can't forget it ourselves. The crowd heard it that day. The key you have to remember is this was Donald Trump's last major official act as president of the United States. The only thing he did after that was pardon a bunch of his friends like Roger Stone and Mike Flynn, skip the inauguration, steal a bunch of documents. But January 6th was the culmination of Donald J. Trump's presidency. And he is currently running for president again as the Republican nominee. 
So we can't memory hole January 6th and act like it didn't happen as much as his people want us to. As much as every time you talk about January 6th on, online, you get pummeled by these MAGA chuds telling you to forget it, that it was fake, that it was a setup, whatever it may be, we cannot afford to do that. So I've had this realization that that's what they've been doing. And so I've been talking about it a lot more. You know, I, I had the pleasure of getting to know their director, a guy named John Long, who's released a movie just recently that's available now on YouTube called Fight Like Hell. <laughs> and it's visceral. It's powerful. It's one of the most powerful versions I've seen of January 6th. The film was shot by an actual former military combat photographer who wore gear to protect himself during the January 6th events and got angles that, frankly, I've never seen. And I've heard since that even the January 6th committee didn't see this, this footage until now. I want you to watch. We're going to talk a little bit about that. We're going to talk a lot about January 6th. We're going to talk about the perspective of it today in this video and this uh, show today. I am on my own for reasons, but I thought it was important enough for me to come talk to you guys about this because we will not memory hole January 6th. Here's the trailer for the film we're going to talk a little bit about today. It's Fight Like Hell. This is not an election between Republicans and Democrats. This is an epic struggle for the future of this country between dark and light. We will win this fight or America will step off into a thousand years of darkness. We're going to protect this president by stopping the steal. Stop the steal? Stop the steal! When I went to bed on election night, he was ahead. The system is a lie. The ballot counting is a lie. It's called democracy. You count every single vote. We did not have a free, fair, and transparent vote. Joe Biden will be removed one way or another. 1776 commence tonight! We are at war. A spiritual war for the soul of this country. The situation we're in is a situation of treason. The punishment for treason is death. The president watches these rallies and he's watching you today. Warning you guys now. You can't stop, it's coming tomorrow. What makes America great? The United States Constitution is different from every other country in the world. Are you willing to do what it takes? Will you fight for America? This election was stolen. The president is willing to stake his reputation that we're going to find criminality there. I know that everyone here will soon be marching over to the Capitol to peacefully and patriotically make your voices heard. We must stop this deal, and we fight. We fight like hell. Freedom! If you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. Powerful. We'll talk more about that. It's so important. You know, after four years of seeing these videos, seeing the violence that day itself, seeing the January 6th committee, the ability to get tired. You know, we as human beings want to forget things that are ugly and, and terrible, want to move on. On top of that, we've got a political opponent who wants you to forget it ever happened. I'm here to tell you, folks. We are never forgetting that day, and we're going to talk about it now. My name is Fred Wellman. As you know, I'm the host of On Demos FP1, right where you are right now on your favorite podcast platforms, YouTube channels, and, of course, the Minus Touch Network. Let's get on the show. Let's talk about this. Welcome, welcome, welcome. As always, I am still Fred Wellman. As always, 30 seconds ago, I still was. It's just amazing. Uh, the power of video. Um, so let's talk about this. So let's talk about the memory holding of January 6th. 
you know, we had the hearings, you know, we've talked about a lot, but the fact is Donald J. Trump is the Republican nominee for a president and has done his very, very best to say it didn't happen. <laughs> okay. And he's done his very best to frame things as it wasn't his fault. You saw that debate clip at the beginning. You know, I, I told them peacefully and patriotically. No, what he told them was to fight like hell, that we wouldn't have a country if they didn't fight like hell. And, and, the, and the mission to memory hold has been a major part of this campaign. And it's just shocking to me. So the important thing I want to talk about is that this was Donald Trump's last major act as president of the United States. Everything he did for four years leads up to that. You know, one of the big things we keep hearing from his supporters is about his policies. You know, life was good under Trump. Uh, I can't tweet now without getting one of those Trump supporters sending me, uh, oh, look how Taco Bell prices have gone up. Do you like paying a lot more for a Taco Bell? Like somehow that just magically happened under Joe Biden and not the mismanaged pandemic under Donald J. Trump or the January 6th insurrection that almost overthrew our democracy in a very real way. So we can't allow them to get away with this game. I've taken to myself just fighting back on all of it, right? You know, and it, and it just, we have to fight back. We have to remember the same thing. I've talked to a number of experts, my friend Ruth Mangiat, who wrote the book uh, Strongman. We'll talk about that a lot in the show because it really matters to what we're talking about. And they agree that the, the, the mission to memory hold January 6th is a key part of the Donald J. Trump presidency uh, uh, campaign. They really want us to forget. You know, since, since that day, over a thousand violent attackers in the Capitol have gone to jail. But a lot of them haven't faced justice, right? You saw on the trailer there, you saw Alex Jones, you saw Nick Fuentes, you saw um, Steve Bannon, you saw Mike Flynn, you saw Roger Stone. Um, there's a great clip. This, so this was all going on. So it's easy to remember or easy to forget that just at the election, before the election, they were setting this up. And then the Stop the Steal movement was born from Ali Alexander, supposedly, and Roger Stone, and it took on a life of its own. By December, by mid-December, this thing had a life of its own. It's easy to forget that there was what they called the Million MAGA March on December 12th in D.C. leading up to this. January 6th did not occur in a vacuum on one day, like they wanted to believe, that a peaceful protest broke out. Here's a great clip from the movie about that Million MAGA March, as they called it, that occurred on December 12th uh, in. And here's some of the key figures. Look what you see giving these speeches, and think about them, and we'll talk about it in a second. We want Nick! We want Nick! We want Nick! What is happening right now is a spiritual war for the soul of this country. It is a spiritual war between Satan and evil and between us, the children of Jesus Christ. This is a Christian nation, and the Christians in this country demand that we have Christian leaders governing this country. Yeah! And we will no longer accept any less. From now on, I identify not as a Republican. I identify as a Trump supporter. Yeah! Alex Jones is it? in 38 days, but I sure know this. Joe Biden is a globalist, and Joe Biden will be removed one way or another. Thank God for Congressman Mo Brooks. He has said that he will object to the House certification on January 6th. And we need some of his colleagues to join him, don't we? We will shut this country down. We believe in some good trouble, right? Yeah. Maybe some make America great again trouble, right? Yeah. 1776. Know those faces? Nick Fuentes, the virulent anti-Semite, the virulent racist, one of the most disgusting people in American politics. Where did Nick Fuentes just recently dine last year? Mar-a-Lago with Donald Trump. Ali Alexander has pretty much disappeared to the face of the earth, but he sure as hell isn't in jail. Alex Jones <laughs> was just on the internet last this week crying because the judge has finally decided to liquidate his assets of Infowars once and for all for the disgusting attacks that he led on the families from Sandy Hook. 
their libel lawsuit against him succeeded. You know, if you remember, he repeatedly and for years ran a nasty set of stories accusing them of being fake, making their lives miserable. People had to flee their homes. He is finally facing justice. But where's Roger Stone? Pardoned. Where's Mike Flynn? Pardoned. Making millions of dollars running around the country with his Christian nationalist movement. He makes no bones about supporting MAGA. So these are the names and faces of January 6th and the lead up to it. And not one of them's in jail. Not one of them has faced consequences for their acts. So for us to memory hole January 6th, it also means we have to memory hole the fact that those who organize it are still on the streets. Those who organize it are still MAGA supporters. Those who organize it have actually worked harder since. You know, Mike Flynn, if those of you who follow the show know, Mike Flynn is suing me for $150 million for a single tweet from three, almost two and a half years ago now, almost three years now. That's what they're doing. That's the legal war for their ending. At the same time, Mike Flynn's been going around the country with his movement of Christian soldiers or the digital soldiers, he's calling them. This hasn't gone away in any way, shape, or form. And if we get comfortable thinking that the thousand people who have gone to jail is the answer, we are in big trouble. And I don't know why these people aren't facing consequences. The good news is, is as we record this show, Jack Smith has filed a 180-page briefing of evidence in support of his indictment of Donald J. Trump for the January 6th events to Judge Chutkin in D.C. Judge Chutkin has authorized that 180 pages. My understanding is she received that 180 pages, and there's supposed to be a lot of explosive stuff in there, the stuff we didn't know about before. So the good news is that the independent counsel isn't playing. He's continuing to pursue the mastermind of this whole thing, Donald Trump, and hopefully others. But here we are. Even Rudy Giuliani. The only, thing, only consequence Rudy Giuliani faced for any of this is bankruptcy because he smeared the ladies in Georgia. The, the, thank God the civil courts are doing their jobs and some of these people are paying because the criminal courts haven't held them accountable. So again, going back to the memory holding, you can't memory hole an event where the perpetrators and the executors and the organizers are still on the streets organizing. And that's where we are. And the leader of the whole thing is the candidate for president of the United States. You know, um, Ruth ben wrote the book Strong men many years ago now. It's been probably five years now. She actually included Donald Trump in the book. And I've, I've seen her speak since then. And, and I, I joke all the time that I think her spidey senses of a historian are tingling right now because of Donald Trump's authoritarian beliefs. We know, look, the thing that, you know, they're trying to sever themselves from Project 2025 right now. You know, Trump keeps saying, oh, I have nothing to do with that. Okay, let's just set that aside. We know it's in Project 2025 now. That's why it's got such a negative interpretation. You know, I interviewed Secretary Pete Buttigieg in, in Chicago for the DNC, and, and he has a great line he uses. He says, you know, it's not often people put their evil plan down on paper <laughs> and print it in a 900-page book, but they did it. But let's talk about Agenda 47, Donald J. Trump's series of videos he's placed on his website. They're still there, Agenda 47. Their video forms are a little bit harder to dig into, but his machinations are very much clear. He intends to get rid of departments of the of, of, uh, of our government. He intends to implement what was called Schedule F. Why do we know he's going to do Schedule F? Because he already did it when he was in president after January 6th. Donald Trump put Schedule F in after January 6th. It was one of his last acts, trying to fire those civil servants who were not loyal to MAGA. That's what they're going to do. So his machinations as an authoritarian, as a strongman, haven't changed in any way. Matter of fact, they've grown stronger. Now he's hell-bent on retribution. I, I don't know how many of you remember. Let's throw this picture up real quick. You know, Let's put this picture up real quick of what I spotted at the Green Tree Festival in Kirkwood, Missouri a year ago. This is at the Missouri Republican Party's booth at a local festival in my old hometown that I grew up in I was visiting. This is what they had in their booth. Look at that. His mugshot. And the words retribution. This is what the Republican Party was using as a as a as a, a prime part of their booth in St. Louis, Missouri, a little town outside of St. Louis. Interesting enough, by the way, I went to that same festival this year, just a week ago, and oddly they didn't have that sign. They must have seen my tweets, maybe. But on top of that, the Democrats were a hell of a lot busier, thank God. But this is what we're seeing. You know, they they want these 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 the, the retribution. This is what strong men, this is what authoritarians do. And we have no reason to believe he won't do that. Because you know why? I already fucking did it. So there's no reason to not believe him when he tells us what we're going to do. Another interesting part of this thing that Ruth ben and I, when Ruth was on the show, oh my gosh, it's been a couple of years now, believe it or not, I need to get her back on, um, 
And we talked about the fact when she had a quote in one of her newsletters. I'm going to read it for you. And it was very important to where we are today, too. Is she said that um, during a coup, some must act and others must stand down so the operation can proceed. What a great line. And that's one of the big arguments you see a lot from our our, our, our other people. I won't say I want to I mean, I'm not going to say friends for sure, but you see from the MAGA crowd that, well, you know, Nancy Pelosi didn't call it the National Guard <laughs> or whatever it is. The fact is Donald Trump sat on his hands for three and a half, four and a half hours in the White House, ignoring the violence as it unfolded. He did not call in the military. His allies elsewhere in the government also sat on their hands. And we're going to argue about that all day. My friends, the DOD, they are my friends, I think made some very serious mistakes that day and have not faced any consequence for that. And that's unfortunate. But we do need to understand the consequences of the fact that many of these people are still in power. We've seen challenges with the U.S. Secret Service. Okay. One of the things that came out of the assassination attempt on Donald Trump in Butler, Pennsylvania, was that his Secret Service detail had gotten, quote, very friendly with him that they had allowed him to get away with things they would never allow to get away with because they were so close to him personally, okay, as like almost a friendly thing. There's no doubt. We all forgot. Don't forget that from reason, some mysterious reason, all the Secret Service text messages from January 6th were deleted when they changed their phone system over. There's actually an investigation of that. These are things we've forgotten, that the institutions that we rely on to protect us I have to believe that maybe we can't believe, rely on them sometimes, that those who need to act in support of whatever authoritarian goals that Donald J. Trump has, they may actually participate. Again, Schedule F, he talks about firing. You know, in Schedule, in, in, in Project 2025, they talk about they'll fire people from the government who even donated to a Democratic candidate. If they just donated in their free time, which they're allowed to do as private citizens, they'll see that as a disloyal act to the Republicans and they'll fire them from that, from government service. You're talking doctors, scientists, nurses, research scientists, weather people who handle the hurricane that's just rolling into Florida. They're talking about getting rid of that whole agency, by the way. Those are the things we're talking about of an authoritarian who had a coup. You know, as my friend Rick Wilson says all the time, a coup that has gone unpunished is practice. And we have to accept that January 6th in many ways was probably practice, which is one again, going back to my theme of this show, we can't memory hole it. Look, we saw this coming and we see it coming now. And I, I, I'm just going to be crazy about this. There are signs, okay? We know now there's a network in Georgia of elected officials, election officials who are coordinating amongst themselves to not certify the election in Georgia. We know now the Georgia election board of unelected officials has voted for hand count balloting. They're implementing rules they're not allowed to rule. And the governor of Georgia, everybody's friend Brian Kemp, refuses to throw them out. We know there's a network of over 70 across the country, that I think ProPublica discovered, of, of election officials who plan to upset and undermine the certification of this election. So they're already preparing. How do we see it in January? I mean, let's just talk about January. Let's get back to January 6th. Here's the mayhem that unfolded the night before January 6th. This is a great clip from the movie of Fight Like Hell. Let's, let's run that clip of mayhem on January 5th. hell is going to break loose tomorrow it's not going to happen like you think it's going to happen okay it's going to be quite extraordinarily different and all i can say is strap in you have made this happen and tomorrow it's game day
That was the night before. And we know what happened the next day. It was interesting footage to me. This is footage I've never seen before, a lot of it. Um, I mean, God bless those policemen. I mean, imagine being a police officer, standing there, taking that abuse from these monsters, calling you these names, and, and just standing there and taking it like they did. Um, I don't think we talk enough about how heroic the Capitol Police and the D.C. Metro Police were that day because they really took it on the chin. And, and some lost their lives. Some took their lives. Um, and that's the most shocking part. So there are warning signs. And as I mentioned, you can see it. You know, there is buzz already. And I hope we're taking this threat seriously. It's one of the reasons I'm doing this show. I want people to hear, let's not forget what happened. Let's not memory hole what happened. This, we saw this coming for weeks after the election. It happened. It's gonna happen this time in some form. Now look, we got good news. Donald Trump isn't the president, that's one. Joe Biden is, and since he's not running, he's got focus, you know, which is a lucky side effect of him deciding to step down. We have to have faith that our DOJ is aware of this. We have to have faith that there's officials who are staying in the way. Just this week, an example of people still doing the right thing. If you were following the news, Nebraska, there was an effort by Lindsey Graham and other Republicans to try and change how Nebraska counts their electoral college votes. Uh, they intended to try and, if you know now, there's the Nebraska large and then Omaha itself is a separate electoral college vote that often helps Democrats because um, it votes blue. And they were trying to actually change that with just 45 days left to the election. And luckily, luckily, a Republican state senator who's from Omaha said, you know what, that's like, I, his quote was terrific. He said, this is like the two minute warning and, and, and the referees coming and saying, hey, we're going to decide that field goals are actually four points now instead of three points. He stood by his guns. He stood by his ethics. And of course, he's taken the chin from Donald Trump for doing it. But we're very blessed to have even Republicans who are stepping up saying, no, nah, this isn't this doesn't work for me. We're not going to do these things. Um, so. We are six weeks or less than six weeks away from election day. Let's talk about where we're going and what's next, I think, in this whole process. Let's take, we've been talking for a while. We never did get our wonderful, wonderful sponsor from Lumen to have a chance. So let's go to our sponsor and then we're going to come back. We're going to talk about where we're going next. Lumen is the world's first handheld metabolic coach. It's a device that measures your metabolism through your breath. And on the app, it lets you know if you're burning fat or carbs and gives you tailored guides to improve your nutrition, workout, sleep, and even your stress management. Not that I have stress in my life. Now, all you have to do is breathe in your lumen first thing in the morning. You'll know what's going on with your metabolism, whether you're burning mostly fats or carbs. Then lumen gives you a personalized nutrition plan for that day based on your measurements. You can also breathe in your before you go on your workouts, before you go for a meal. You know exactly what's going on in your body in real time, and lumen will give you tips to keep you on top of your health game. So, look, your metabolism is your body's engine. We all know this. You probably learned this in health class, right? It's how your body turns the food you eat into the fuel that keeps you going. I've been tracking macros and nutrients and nutrition for years as I try to maintain my health as I age. Because your metabolism is the center of everything your body does, optimal metabolic health translates to a bunch of benefits, including easier weight management, improved energy levels, better fitness results, better sleep, better moods even, if you will. Lumen gives you recommendations to improve your metabolic health right in your hand. So if you want to take the next step in improving your health, go to lumen.me slash Fred. You'll get 15% off your Lumen. That is L-U-M-E-N dot me slash Fred for 15% off your purchase. Thank you, Lumen, for sponsoring our show this week. We really appreciate you. And man, it's a great device. You know, the biggest thing that concerns me is that Donald Trump is saying openly, openly, that he intends to pardon the January 6th perpetrators. He calls them political prisoners. He calls them heroes, okay? He said that with no uncertain terms that he intends to do that. Here's a, here's a clip of one of the times he said that. I'd love to ask you about January 6th. Uh, you've called yourself the candidate of law and order. Yeah. When Time Magazine asked you if you would consider pardoning all the rioters, you said, yes, absolutely. Sure. You called them patriots. 140 police officers were assaulted that day. Their injuries included broken bones, at least one officer lost an eye, one had two cracked ribs, two smashed spinal discs, another had a stroke. Were the people who assaulted those 140 officers, including those I just mentioned, patriots who deserve pardons? Well, let me bring it back to modern day. Like about five days ago, we had an attack on the Capitol. 
horrible attack on the Capitol. Uh, you saw the people that were protesting and spraying these incredible monuments, bells, lions, all these magnificent limestone and granite with red paint, red spray paint that will never actually come off, especially on the limestone. It will never, I'm a builder, I know about this stuff. It'll never, you'll see it in a hundred years from now. They viciously attacked our government. They fought with police. They fought with them much more openly than I saw on January 6th. What's going to happen to those people? What's going to happen to the people in Portland that destroyed that city? But sir, my question city? is on those. What's going to happen to my the people that tried to My question is on those rioters who assaulted Excuse officers. Me. You have to. Ask, would you pardon those people? What's going to happen? Oh, absolutely, I would. You if would pardon innocent, those. If they're innocent, I would pardon them. They've been convicted. And by the way, the Supreme Court just <laughs> under. Well, they were convicted by a very, a very tough system. They're yeah. So he's very obvious. But here's the thing: we also think that I want to think about. I want you to think about, especially right now, is having a conversation with a friend on the way in here. Trump, everyone expects that Trump will pardon himself if given the chance. If we give Donald J. Trump the presidency again, everyone, it's just commonly expected that Donald Trump will stop the federal cases against him. Look, he's running to stay out of prison. Let's be honest, okay? It's fully expected that Donald Trump will pardon himself for all the crimes and especially a January 6th case. He will do it. And what's really interesting to me, I was kind of joking with a friend about this, is how this is being treated by so many people, not just the media, but even pundits and, and political experts who are almost like it's a policy difference. It's like, well, you know, Kamala Harris wants to tax corporations and Donald Trump doesn't want to tax corporations. And you know, Kamala Harris isn't going to pardon herself for crimes, but Donald Trump's going to pardon himself for crimes. <laughs> like there's two fucking sides to this thing. There aren't. One of the candidates plans to be a president for all Americans and follow the law and follow the norms and traditions. And one plans to get himself out of his own fucking crimes. Sorry. <laughs> you know, and that's the thing. That's the difference. These aren't policy difference, folks. This isn't just a difference of opinion. We have a guy running for president who fully intends to use the power of the presidency to commit crimes. And he installed a Supreme Court that has every intention of allowing him to do it. That's the stakes we talk about. We're constantly talking about the horse race. Oh, the polls. Oh, Harris is up five. Oh, Pennsylvania should have picked Shapiro. The stakes of this election is the future of our democracy. That's the stakes. We have a guy who plans to pardon himself. So when you think about this, when you talk to your friends and neighbors, when you're talking to those Republicans who may still be on the fence and haven't decided they want to actually vote or they want to not vote for Donald Trump, great. When you talk to your Democratic friends who are thinking about not voting over whatever, I don't like her policy, I don't like the situation in Israel, I don't like the situation in Ukraine, whatever their reason is, look, man, I, I, somebody says it best, better than me, which is, look, we're not, this isn't, you're not choosing a lover, you're not choosing a husband or wife, you're choosing a candidate. And it's not, it's like getting on a bus. You need a punt, somebody who's going to get you pretty close to your destination. And there's no question in my mind or yours that Kamala Harris and Tim Waltz will get us pretty damn close. If nothing else, they're not going to drive us off a freaking cliff. And that's the choice we face. And that's the choice you must. And that's why, why we're talking about January 6th, Donald J. Trump's final biggest act as president of the United States. He tried over with the government, folks. So... I know it's uncomfortable watching these films. I, I had a hard time watching A Fight Like Hell the first time through. It's an hour and a half. It's available on YouTube. Uh, we really had to put that up. Here's a link. There's two links here. Here's the link to the YouTube of the show. I really want you to watch this film. I really want you to share this film. I really want you to just feel it again. We need to feel because you need to feel just how important it is that this election is. You need to feel that gut reaction you had the first time you saw this unfold in real time on January 6th, four years ago. We need to remember what happened and you need your friends and family to remember what happened. So here's a link. Uh, we'll put that up. And then here's a link to uh, Be Heard Pack, which pack I work with as well. Um, it's been working with Fight Like Hell, trying to spread the word about the movie. You can find out more information there. Here's a link to that too. The fact is is I need you to watch the link, think about it and share it, at least watch part and just feel again and remember the stakes of this election. We are less than six weeks away, folks. Right now, it's looking good. It's looking great. Wins at our back. I love the Harris campaign's joy. I love the positivity. I love what they're focusing on as priorities. I love the fact we're trying to turn out Democratic voters because when we fight, we win. When we vote, we're going to win. But there's folks like us who have to come out here and remind you of the stakes of this election. 
Anybody who's in the fence about Donald J. Trump, anybody who wants to tell you that his policies are better or that life was better under Trump. And my God, Taco Bell was cheaper back then, Fred. Gas was cheap. Yeah, no shit. There was a freaking pandemic. Go back and say, January 6th, you know, there's a funny bit, and I won't show it because we'll get a copyright strike, I think, right, Matt? <laughs> there's a funny bit from Family Guy, right? The, the Family Guy clip, and there's this wonderful scene in Family Guy where Lois decided to run for office, uh, I think mayor, uh, of, uh, right after 9-11. And she discovered, if you guys all know this clip, that she, when she says the words 9-11, everybody cheers, woo! <laughs> you know, and it's like, it's like that. And, you know, we don't do that with January 6th, right? But you need to. You know, somebody says, hey, you know what? Life was great under Donald Trump, man. I, I didn't have to pay, you know, $3 for eggs. Go January 6th. <laughs> Do it like Lois. You know, January 6th. Okay, January 6th matters because this was Trump's act as president. Look, I'm going to tell you a secret, you guys. The president doesn't control gas prices. I know, right? Who knew? He doesn't control or she doesn't control eggs. Okay. They don't do any of that. Okay. They don't. But they damn sure control the United States military and they damn sure control the elements of our government that could be used to overthrow that same government. They damn sure control appointing judges that will get rid of a dob or get rid of abortion. They damn sure control judges who decided that eh, what's a little crime by the president. That's what presidents do. For real. So when you want to blame Kamala Harris and Joe Biden for the price of eggs, just say, you know what? I don't think they had to do with it, but I'll tell you this, January 6th sure had a lot to do with Donald J. Trump. And what he's got in mind for his next iteration is a thousand times worse. And we won't recover. So be very clear. You have the power. You have, the, you have one power that no one can take away from you. You have the one power. Vote. Vote like your life depends on it. Vote like your kids' lives depend on it. Get your kids to vote. They're adults. Get your friends to vote. Get a minivan and drive those people. Little minivans aren't really cool anymore, are they, Matt? Nobody has a fucking minivan anymore. <laughs> Thank God. I, I think they're going. I thought I think I saw an article of minivans are going away. Thank God. Just I hated them. I had a sport minivan though. It was pretty cool, but that's near here there. That's <laughs> when I had four kids. <laughs> Kidding aside, get your friends and neighbors. Drive your ass to the voting booth. And if you're in a state that has early voting, like Virginia does right now, I think Montana's early voting, a couple states like Michigan's early voting, vote early. And I'll tell you why I want you to vote early, folks. Because when you vote early. It helps your favorite candidate know where they don't need to worry about spending money. If it, they, every day, the candidates will get like month, they'll get a, they get a report every day from the Secretary of State's office that says how many people voted. Um, and, you know, and then they'll, they'll know, you know, I don't know, it's from this part of the town, it's from that part of town. Uh, I don't know if you saw Arlington, Virginia, on the first day of voting in Fair, uh, or maybe it was Fairfax County. Fairfax, Virginia um, had. They had, I think, 175% increase in voters from 2020, early voters. I mean, people people waiting in line around the block on day one of early voting. So the enthusiasm's there. So if you vote early, if you send your absentee ballot in early, it allows those campaigns, the ones you care about, like your congressman and your senator and your governor and your, your uh, president – candidates to know where they don't necessarily need to spend their money because we're down to the wire here folks it's five weeks five and a half weeks we don't want them spending money they don't need to spend so if you got the opportunity in your region to vote early vote early number two vote early you'll know if you're on the rolls they have been throwing people off the voter rolls texas oklahoma florida the, georgia they are throwing people off the voter rolls who haven't voted in a while so maybe you haven't voted in a while maybe you decide to sit it out because you're sick of it all i get it maybe you've never voted before because you're 18 i get that voting early if you can checking your registration if you can if you go to i will vote uh, that will tell you check that early you'll know if you're eligible but if you wait till election day and you show up at the election office and you're not on the rolls your vote doesn't count yeah you could do a provisional ballot but let's just vote Let's just vote early. That's the power we have. They will choose violence. They will choose that direction. We will not. We who love democracy, this show is called On Democracy. We who love democracy will not choose violence ever. Don't let them accuse us of that. We will never cheer violence. We will never choose criminal Eric. Hell, Eric Adams, the Democratic mayor of New York, just got indicted. You don't see a single Democrat going, well, you know, he told me it's fine. I mean, that's the funniest thing. I haven't seen a single Democrat politician say, well, I talked to Eric Adams and, and we prayed on it and he says he didn't do it. So I believe him. You know, you'll never see a Democrat say stupid shit like that. You will Republicans. So 
No violence, no that kind of stuff. When we say fight like hell on our side, it means go to the ballot. Go to your ballot. Fill your ballot out properly. Turn it in. Vote, vote, vote. That's what you can do to stop this mayhem and stop this future of more mayhem from Donald Trump. So that's it. I'm not going to take more of your time. Please check out Fight Like Hell. It's gutting. It's important. It's film you've never seen before to remind you of what we went through in those days. Share it with your friends. Share it on social media. That matters. In the meantime, get out there, folks. We've only got a few weeks left. You can make a difference in this election. You can make a difference in a campaign even now to canvas. We are down to 4% undecided. 4%. Three to four percent. I've seen two polls now. Three to four percent undecided. It's the lowest number of undecided voters in modern history in, in the 21st century, which is the last 24 years. What does that tell you? People have made up their mind, and what matters now is getting them to vote. Because we vote, we win. I think it's 95% support in the Democratic Party, according to polls, for Ms. Harris. Okay, great. Vice President Harris needs your vote. <laughs> you need to show up. North Carolina, you gotta show up because that guy Mark Robinson is freaking crazy, right? Show up and vote and we'll win. That's what we got to do. So with that, I've, in, I've implored you to get to work. I hope you heard it. <laughs> see me here every week for My Touch Network, 11 o'clock, of course. You can see us on the On Democracy podcast YouTube channel as well. Follow me on social media, at FP Wellman. I am going on a tour with Vote Vets next week. I, you're the first to hear it. I'm, I'll tell you more about that if you follow me on social media. We're going on a bus tour around the country to talk about veterans issues. I hope you'll follow that along on all my social media channels. In the meantime, Thanks for joining me here. We'll see you next week.